Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Camila Coz, and I am a senior policy analyst at the Migration Policy Institute. I would like to welcome you to a webinar forging partnership to make reintegration of migrants more effective and sustainable. I'll start with a housekeeping note. Um, if you have any technical problem, please email events at migrationpolicy.org. We will have a Q&A at the end of the call. Um, there will not be a voice Q&A, so please type any question into the Q&A box or email them to events at migrationpolicy.org. And this webinar outlined some findings from the report uh, we are releasing today drawing on interviews uh, with policymaker, practitioner, researcher in 29 countries, and it is available on the MPI website uh, via the link on, on the screen. So before we start today, I would like to share some reflection about why we're organizing this public event um, on a topic that may seem a bit niche, the local embeddedness of, of reintegration support and specifically referral mechanism for migrants who return to their country of origin. Because for years in countries of destination, the focus was on encouraging the voluntary return of as many migrants without legal status as possible. And we're seeing now slowly a shift in the approach with more European policymaker trying, advocating for more robust reintegration program to support returnees, but also the community they're returning to. And on the other side, in turn, um, government in countries of origin are also seeking, for instance, to better document uh, the profile of the population of returnees, and they try to connect them with the public services that, that are available. So both in countries of origin and in country of destination, policymaker, practitioner, researcher increasingly acknowledge that you know, for returning migrants, reintegration is a multidimensional process, and it's a process that, that takes time. And therefore, when it comes to the assistance provided to returning to resettle in their countries of origin, a number of, of European programs are moving away from the standardized individual package and instead provide support that takes into account the various needs uh, of returnees and their community. And these uh, need to cover social, economic, psychosocial dimension. And therefore it's become increasingly clear that not one single service provider uh, can offer all the services. And so it's precisely to discuss this uh, partner, the, the partnership that are needed, this network of support um, that we wanted to organize a conversation today that is how to embed reintegration assistance into the local environment of public services, community initiative, development programs, to first expand the varieties of services available to returnees, but also to ensure that they are more tailored, more sustainable. And these referral also help to think about reintegration as a process that goes beyond the individual returnee, but also benefit um, the broader community. So, Today, we'll first discuss the different form of referral mechanism that exists in reintegration program uh, with my colleague Ravina, because we often talk about different things when we talk about referrals in the framework of reintegration program. And then we have three panelists representing different institutions working in different geographies who will share their perspective about this topic, how referrals are organized, what challenges service provider face, what difficulty the organization that returning are referred to encounter and what has changed um, over the past few years. And also what should be the orientation for the next few years for European reintegration program, for policies in countries of origin and for the work of international organization and civil society actors. And so first I'd like to turn to my colleague Raven Sost, who is an associate policy analyst at MPI Europe um, and Ravina, maybe if you could first, you know, set the scene, um, share an overview of what we mean when we talk about referral mechanism for, for migrants who've returned to their country of origin, you know, what type of organization do they involve and, and how they organize? Yeah, thank you, Camille. Thank you for that introduction. Um, so yes, exactly. I will just quickly set the scene of what uh, referral mechanisms look like. And it's going to be quite descriptive, but I think it's important to clarify these concepts because um, when we speak about them, it's just important we share the same ideas. Um, and so throughout the report and when we conducted the interviews and reviewed different programs, it became clear that 
what we call referral mechanisms actually apply to a wide range of different practices. Um, and to broadly understand, I think there are two ways um, in which referral mechanisms differ. The first one is which partners are involved. And the second one is how these partners interact and what type of agreement they have among each other. So let me say a few words to each of these two dimensions um, and then I'll pass over. Um, first to the partners that are involved in referral mechanisms. So when we think about uh, chronologically sort of from the perspective of a European return uh, process, the point where referral mechanisms usually start are the lead reintegration partners. Those are the, pro, uh, the organizations that are contracted by donors um, and who are responsible for leading the reintegration program. This could be, for example, IUM, um, whom we have here, but also smaller civil society organizations like, for example, Weldo in Pakistan. Um, in many cases, these organizations have the option to refer returnees to other organizations for a variety of reasons. And my colleague Camille already said it just um, just a minute ago. Um, it may be to get identification documents, it may be to enter vocational training, um, to get mental health support, or a variety of other reasons. Um, there are different options for this referral to happen. Either they can be external or they can be internal. Internal referrals are somewhat less common, I would say, and they refer basically to um, a referral that stays within the same organization, but just moves to another program within that, within that organization. External referrals, on the other side, um, move the returnees sort of out of, um, out of the, the main reintegration partners uh, realm and to another, to another, um, to another partner. Um, and at that receiving end of, of referrals, so there can be a variety of different organizations again, most often we see that they're public services. These can be both national or local public services. Um, it may be private companies, although this is still relatively rare, um, or civil society organizations. And here really the scope is, is very large and um, very broad. Okay, that was the first point. So these are the actors basically that can be involved. The second point is um, how these different partners interact. And I think here it's really important to see this not as sort of distinct categories, but really more so as a gliding scale of, of, of types of agreements and types of working together. Um, the main distinction that's important here is whether the referral partner receives funding or not from the, um, from the main reintegration partner. Um, there can be there can be no funding in both formal or less formal um, referral mechanisms, um, and funding can also do, take different forms. For example, funding can be taken as sort of a per returnee um, funding that's attached to a certain service that the returnee receives, or it can be broader and then also involve funding that, for example, goes to capacity building, IT equipment, etc. So that's really a broad scope of different um, of different approaches. Um, so this is mostly descriptively who are the partners involved and how they interact. Uh, I think we're going to come back to, to sort of more critical reflection and recommendations later, but perhaps two little points to finish off this year. One is that um, the combination of these, these aspects that I just mentioned, they have really important um, consequences for monitoring evaluation um, with a tendency that those that have funding attached to them and formal agreements tend to be more more tightly monitored, whereas informal agreements without funding tend to be much looser in that regard. And the second aspect is that there are, of course, trade-offs to be made between these different options um, and that these should be considered. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Ravina. Um, and I'll now turn to Vojkan Milovanovic, sorry, who's joining us from Serbia, um, where he is head of office and project coordinator at the NGO Help Serbia. Um, so, Vargan, for many years now um, at Help Serbia, you've been working with the German Information Center on Migration, Training and Employment, DMAC, um, which is a center that helps returnees from Germany and other countries to reintegrate and to access vocational training, jobs, start a business in, in Serbia. Um, and so I invited, like we invited you today also, if you, to, if you could share, you know, the, the nature of your cooperation with DMAC, 
um, as an actor based in Serbia, as a CSO actor, uh, but also what are the main advantage of having a formal referral mechanism between DMAC uh, and your, your own organization? Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting, uh, inviting help for, for this webinar. Uh, I will just briefly say something about help. Uh, uh, help is a German organization established in 81, and now we are operating in more than 20 countries. And the uh, main focus is on humanitarian assistance, on uh, supporting startup businesses, as well as doing uh, reconstruction of uh, premises for socially vulnerable uh, population. Uh, in uh, January 2018, we started a project uh, funded by German uh, Federal uh, Ministry for Economic uh, uh, Development and Cooperation through GIZ. And this actually the project is the first project that we uh, started uh, working with people, uh, asylum seekers who return back to Serbia. But uh, the, how we reach uh, these people, we, we still have ongoing uh, project related to this. We are using a network of uh, local organizations who are uh, informing people about the options that we are offering uh, for the assistance. And uh, in uh, this, sometimes in December 2020, we added a new uh, project component uh, related to supporting transnational cases, which is actually referral system in cooperation with uh, DMAC. And uh, the, what DMAC is doing is actually intermediating between uh, uh, people who are still in Germany and uh, are, uh, are destined to come back uh, in a recent period of time to, back to Serbia and us. They are informing them about uh, the assistance that we are providing uh, and uh, we are trying to, to uh, assist them once they come back to, to Serbia. And usually when uh, DMAC informs us about uh, such case, usually it takes one week uh, up to a couple of weeks. Uh, we have this much uh, time to, to react and to, to try to help, uh, help uh, this family or uh, individuals who are coming back. Uh, as for the type of assistance that we are providing, uh, we are talking about um, uh, reconstruction of houses, uh, uh, providing uh, furniture and uh, household uh, utilities, uh, also providing kind uh, uh, donations for startup businesses, vocational business trainings, uh, also doing uh, uh, supply, uh, providing uh, school supplies for children. And uh, also one thing we never had before is temporary accommodation intended for those uh, who don't have or uh, imagine somebody who comes back uh, at night uh, by a plane and uh, they're in Belgrade and they are somewhere like 200 kilometers away from Belgrade. Uh, we are providing this uh, temporary accommodation for at least for a couple of days so that they can uh, plan their, uh, their activities. And we are also providing uh, transport to their uh, location where, the, where they used to live. Uh, uh, so far, as I mentioned, we started in 2000, December 2020, and uh, we had a problem with uh, because of the COVID-19, uh, because uh, temporarily all the all movements, all transport of uh, these people stopped. And uh, uh, until now, we have about uh, 40 people uh, who expressed their uh, their interest in uh, and applied for different kinds of assistance. And out of that number, uh, 33 people received at least one uh, type of assistance. Uh, what is also important uh, with, uh, with this referral system is that uh, uh, they are getting information uh, whilst they're still in, uh, in Germany. And we even organized in cooperation with DMAC, we even organized a couple of uh, uh, online meetings with families uh, to answer questions, whatever they're, they're interested in, and uh, to also explain additionally uh, regarding the, the assistance that we are providing. Now, as far as the uh, limitations come, uh, is concerned, uh, the biggest limitation is actually um, uh, the project itself because it's time limited. So something that we can provide now, uh, we cannot uh, maybe provide it next year. So this is uh, one of the crucial obstacles. Uh, but in general, um, every uh, single person that we assist in any, any way, they need to go through uh, they need to fulfill some criteria, additional criteria. For example, and this is something we cannot overlook. Um, it's regarding, for example, uh, reconstruction of the uh, houses. They need to have uh, 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 houses with permit or uh, in a process of uh, legalization. 
uh, otherwise we cannot do anything uh, anything with that uh, also uh, related to to this uh the problem with uh, reconstruction is that sometimes uh the amount of works uh, needed for this reconstruction is way over the budget that, uh, that we have uh, for example it's not possible for, uh, to invest any money uh, in uh, unconditional uh, uh, building and uh, to if you do one room re reconstruct one room for example still they can't live it uh, live inside so this is the one of the the biggest uh, problems uh as also uh, regarding the the income generating activities they need to be legally registered uh but in general we are trying to solve the problem uh, which is the benefit of uh, having uh, this kind of a kind of a referral system we are trying to do as much as possible whilst they are still in uh, in Germany uh for example we have professional engineers uh, for reconstructions uh who are visiting uh, their house and uh, trying to um trying to assess the the situation and uh, if possible to to do all the work uh, uh, before they come back uh, from uh, from Germany but in general in the general uh, cooperation with Dimac was nothing but success and completely uh i mean uh, communication level of communication and coordination is absolutely perfect so no complaints on that uh, and uh, definitely uh referral system is is a, a way to go uh, when the, the, when we are talking about this uh, this assistance type of assistance or uh, this target group Thank you very much, Vojken, for, for this example um, yeah, of a concrete uh, referral mechanism between, you know, Jays and DMAC, uh, but a, a civil society organization. And, and now I would like to turn um, to Abram Tamrat, who is the regional program coordinator at the International Organization for Migration Regional Office in Dakar, because IOM in the framework of the EU IOM Joint Initiative um, has also been involved in a lot of this work on referrals. Um, the joint initiative has been now ongoing for several years. It covers 26 countries. It had aimed to support assisted return, voluntary return and reintegration of, of migrants, as well as to strengthen the capacity of state, non-state actors, migration governance, and work with community. And so as part of this program, IOM has tried to formalize referral mechanism between its own services and government, civil society organizations, as well as the private sector. So Abram, over to you. Uh, if you can share a bit about for the drivers for these activities, what, uh, what was the starting point, and give us some example of how you've managed to formalize this referral mechanism, how you've had different experiences, depending on the partner you, you work with. Thank you, Camille, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, the EU IOM Joint Initiative um, identified the referral mechanisms are uh, one of the key deliverables of the program uh, from the onset and uh, took it as uh, the fundamental uh, component that needs to be there for uh, return migration management uh mechanisms in a country to function um, so to this end the eu iron joint initiative implemented various actions to uh, be able to create formal referral mechanisms in a, in a uh, in the countries and politician countries um and we can see these uh, initiatives in classified into uh four areas uh the first one is in terms of creating a common understanding uh among stakeholders on what are the vulnerabilities, the needs and uh, the potential of return migrants. Uh, there were significant, uh, let's say, uh, focus only on, for example, particularly on uh, victims of trafficking as far as national systems are concerned. So uh, we needed to expand the, the scope a little bit and have a common understanding uh, before we start uh, coming up with these systems. So uh, organizing awareness of institutions uh, and gaining the political commitment and then driving uh, force that is needed from the government counterpart, that was uh, an essential part of it. And coming up with a roadmap uh, to this effect. Um, second area is in terms of defining the minimum set of services and support that are needed 
Um, and for that, uh, we had to actually come up with a, a sample SOP that incorporated various lessons learned from various projects and uh, countries and introducing, of course, the latest principles and standards that we need. Um, that actually served as the, the, the main foundation for us to conduct uh, mapping exercises. And we have partnered with, uh, for example, Samuel Hall at the beginning uh, and conducting uh, socioeconomic uh, and the community uh, mapping related exercises that identify different areas and locations. Uh, but also different complementary uh, mapping exercises that focused on, uh, for example, Tibet uh, institutions, shelters, or specific sector actors, calls for expression of interest and uh, through uh, engagement with sectoral and business membership organizations, uh, particularly in, uh, in, in uh, identifying private sector uh, partners uh, was uh, quite essential in there. Um, all this led towards the uh, formal development of national SOPs and uh, validation of uh, such uh, mechanisms in, in the country. Uh, so uh, setting up technical teams at national level uh, led by government counterparts that uh, took forward this draft SOP and the sample SOP that we had uh, and contextualizing it and coming up with a, a, a made. SOP per country, that was an exercise that went through a lot of review and validation uh, exercises. And this, uh, the EUIM Joint Initiative uh, supported that in uh, all the countries, implementation countries in that. Um, this was also, again, complemented by a bilateral agreement uh, that was signed with different uh, CSOs, government agencies that might have a particular type of service. Uh, and uh, drilling into the, uh, of course, uh, what are the specific criteria, eligibility, and so forth. Um, while uh, I say this, uh, I think the normative frameworks and uh, the kind of work that we were doing in terms of policy, legislative, and related uh, uh, areas uh, have actually created the uh, enabling environment for us to move these things much faster. Um, and of course, the coordination, migration, uh, governance coordination structures that are uh, put in place uh, in each country were critical in bringing in every uh, stakeholder and then pushing this uh, uh, agenda forward. Uh, maybe just as a last point, may, I would like to uh, highlight on the. Abram, you just cut. Um... While you come back, I'll just I'll I'll, I'll just go back on, on a few points you made. Um, the one is the starting point on, on this mapping, um, uh, and then it, it was interesting that you uh, emphasize the role of private sector because it, when we think about a referral, we often think about government partners, civil society organization, and maybe less so private sector, especially in countries where the informal sector uh, prevail. And so it's it's sometimes more difficult to find um, this type of partner. And, and I think another point you mentioned um, that is very important is the governance of this, um, because we know for this mapping, um, they may become updated quite quickly. And so you need to have an institution, an organization that maybe own this, um, this referral, this, uh, all of this mapping uh, mechanism and can update um, the program, the eligibility criteria as, as they evolve. Um, Abraham, I just had a second question for you, if you're still here, which is, we've yeah. seen all of this mechanism being developed, all this agreement uh, being developed on paper, but we also know, and that's a key takeaway from our research, but also other the, the research of other partners, that they're welcome for a step, but then operationalizing this formal agreement is often a key, uh, a key challenge in terms of funding, in terms of technical assistance, monitoring eligibility criteria, so from, from your perspective and the experience you've had under the joint initiative, um, if you had a few points to share on this. Uh, thank you again. Uh, sorry, I had to turn off my video uh, because of the internet stability. Um, so in terms of once these uh, SOPs and agreements have been actually formalized, uh, the next step was, okay, where do we go from here and what kind of uh, 
uh, requirements are there for it to function properly. Uh, what we immediately uh, noticed in that regard is the uh, capacity gaps uh, with the actors. Some of them, they do have the mandate and they do have the desire to work uh, on uh, providing services uh, to beneficiaries, but they would lack either the technical capacity or uh, resources to, to move uh, forward and provide the services. Um, so uh, the first and most important part of operationalizing this uh, was uh, building, designing, uh, capacity building uh, set of activities uh, that are informed by a needs assessment, uh, capacity uh, gap needs assessment, and uh, providing trainings. It could be technical uh, trainings, specializing, for example, the MHPSS actors, especially uh, with all the returnees that we had here. Uh, only few return without, for example, MHPSS related mental health and sexual support needs. And uh, designing an, a, a training, a set of trainings and uh, material support and so forth for structures that are uh, able to provide this type of support was an important part for the referral to actually work. And uh, we can mention examples uh, in, in different countries, uh, including uh, Cameroon, Nigeria, and so forth, where uh, and the Gambia, where such uh, uh, extensive capacity building support was actually uh, done to be able to start referring cases to, uh, to benefit from the services. Uh, so um, that aspect of capacity building becomes very critical. Uh, dissemination and sensitization is also an essential part of it. Uh, for all actors at different levels uh, to know about the national uh, SOP, and for them to start actually uh, either referring a case or request to receive a case uh, or to provide a service, that was critical. Uh, it was also very critical for the retainees to know the type of service that are provided uh, by different actors uh, and for them to show interest. Uh, here, uh, that is very critical because the for any referral to uh, materialize, there has to be a set of uh, things that need to align. Uh, the opportunity, the intake capacity of the partner, the location of where services are provided, the schedule duration uh, and background of the returnee, uh, motivation, whether the returnee is actually willing to and uh, motivated to uh, attend this type of service that is provided, and of course, availability of resources. And for that to be properly convinced, uh, the dissemination sensitization part of it was uh, quite essential. Um, and of course, cascading down one thing that we had not uh, initially foreseen, which was setting up a national level structures was one thing, but in order for it to be closer to the uh, community and to the returnees, um, cascading this structure into local level, state level, for example, actors. And we had to pilot it in several uh, countries uh, where we needed to uh, create a state level, for example, uh, mechanisms that would make sure that they involve more actors from the community, as well as uh, closely follow the beneficiaries uh, going forward. Um, and my maybe last point. Okay, uh, go ahead. Last my point. last point would be Okay, uh, in terms of designing complementary services. So there could be a partner that can provide a certain type of uh, skills training, for example, but they do not provide uh, accommodation or transport or subsistence support to, to, to their beneficiaries. So we needed for each partner that is identified as a referral, uh, we needed to design a particular complementary support that would make sure that they uh, it didn't allowed the retainee to participate in this uh, service that they are providing. Uh, over to you. Sorry. Thanks. Thank you very much. And, and I think um, among other points, you mentioned this, uh, the need for alignment of different uh, different condition. And I think that's the that key point that maybe um, our last speaker, Nessie Majidi, who's the co-founder and director of Samuel Lol. Can, can speak to. Um, Nassim, you've worked extensively on voluntary return and reintegration with a wide range of partners, and I was hoping that you could share your perspective on, on, on a specific type of referral, which is um, the last work you've done with the European Return and Reintegration 
network uh, Erin and the efforts to connect returnees with ongoing development programs. Thank you, thank you. And I'll try not to repeat what everyone else has said. <laughs> so I'll try to reference what you just all mentioned, which were all great points. I wanted to come back, first of all, and say, when we talk about referrals, we should really remember it's not just about referring one returnee to one service, but really thinking in terms of a continuum of service. So thinking more in terms of referral mechanism, so a process of cooperation to bridge the gaps in assistance, because I think the elephant in the room is that, is because we know there are gaps between reintegration services and ongoing development projects in many contexts of return. So this gap is really what we're talking about here, is the main challenge that needs to be addressed if we want uh, reintegration to be sustainable. So you mentioned the work we just um, recently finished for the European Return and Reintegration Network, Erin, so the objective of that work from the start was to address that gap, was to provide guidance on how to better uh, bring together reintegration and development sectors, because we know these are two very different worlds, speaking two very different languages with different funding streams, timelines and all the rest. So we know they don't always work um, in the same way or understand each other. So we need to bring these together to address, to address the gaps. So to be able to offer guidance to both development actors and reintegration actors, first, we had to look at what makes this cooperation so difficult? Why is it that it's not easy for development actors and reintegration actors to work together? So in our report, which was just released last week, we basically found that there was miscommunication, misalignment across different scales or what we call dilemmas. Uh, we listed about 10 dilemmas that need to be worked through, and I just want to go through three of them, three of them now. Um, one is the geographies. So beyond just the pre-departure and post-arrival coordination that needs to happen, we know very well that in many contexts of return, development actors are not present. This can be if returnees go back to urban environments where development um, actors may not be present, or if they're spread out, scattered across rural areas. So there may actually not be any development structure to speak of to which actors can refer returnees to benefit from a continuum of services. So that's the first geographical gap. The second one was just mentioned by Abraham is one of timelines. So reintegration programming tend to be short-term, development programming long-term, and returnees often fall through the cracks in the middle in between. Uh, so they get lost in the process and we see many returnees coming back being just very confused as to who they can turn to for what. So what we know is that referrals should intervene immediately upon return and link to the long term. So we need to really expand the time horizon of reintegration programming to facilitate greater collaboration with the uh, development sector. We could also think of ways for group referrals to take place so that at least there are specific timeframes or timed returns to establish effective referrals. And this is something that I know development actors have been asking for. And the third one is around eligibility criteria, which you mentioned, Kemi. Um, referrals should really be open to all, all returnees. Yet often uh, we know referral services are only available to returnees who have returned voluntarily or through a specific program. And this eligib eligibility criteria can be another challenge or returnees may be targeted in their communities of return, but host communities may be, may be discarded. So again, there's a misalignment here between the individual focus of reintegration programs and the area-based focus of, of um, development programs because development actors focus on community needs, reintegration actors usually focus on individuals. So there's a need to work together. And Abraham was saying great progress has been made um, to bring these actors together. So it's really working through these challenges that can allow reintegration and development actors to really come together um, as part of these referral mechanisms. Thank you very much, Nassim, uh, for outlining this three trade off. And, and yes, there, there are a few more that you outline in the report. Um, and if I can ask you a follow up question as to the next steps, if you have some thoughts on moving forward, um, some, yeah, some ideas where you see uh, where you, this program needs to go to achieve this, because 
we know what the issues are, but um, yeah, it, it's been quite a challenge to address them. Yeah, I think whether we talk about reintegration and development actors or countries of origin and countries of destination, what we need is to move away from the dilemmas that I mentioned. And so that's what we do in the operational framework in the report. We try to focus now on where we can find areas of coherence and synergy where they can actually speak the same language where objectives can meet each other. So we aimed in our operational framework uh, to move away from, from the binaries of destination and origin countries to think instead of um, operational planning. How can we plan the steps needed to build referral mechanisms? So here we thought about four stages that for us are essential from the pre-design, design, implementation and monitoring. Because as you say in your, in your policy brief very well, monitoring shouldn't be an afterthought. It should really be thought about from the start. But similarly, we need to spend a lot more time, actors need to spend more time together in the pre-design and design phases of any reintegration program. And we all know, usually this time is not taken. So let, just, let me just give you two, three examples uh, based on, on the work that, that we did. So in the pre-design phase, that's where we talk about the need to map what services exist, what services are not there to avoid duplication, but also to address the gap I was mentioning. Um, in the design phase, here we highlight uh, and really underline that returnees need to be consulted in the pre-design and design phase of referral mechanisms. Um, and whether it's through local cooperation mechanisms uh, or different cooperation models that we can think, returnees really need to have a seat at the table and be part of the consultation process with local government, non-state actors and their community. So it really needs to be a full-fledged consultative process of identifying the needs and the services. Then when we move to the implementation phase, Revina explained it very well, you have internal or external referral uh, mechanisms, but you also have national referral systems or hub-based referral systems. So if I take an example, for example, of UNDP, United Nations Development Program in Georgia, um, recognizing that returnees were scattered all over the country, um, they supported the government to provide decentralized services in key hubs or locations in the country so that development actors could focus on providing services in these hubs and then making sure um, that there were enough connections then on the reintegration side to make sure returnees could access those hubs. And then I, I can't finish without mentioning monitoring, which has been one of our key areas of focus in these last 10 years. Here in terms of monitoring, there are different frameworks that exist. Great progress has been made in terms of outlining indicators. I think what we need now are common indicators that both reintegration and development actors can use. Uh, one indicator could be the number of returnees actually involved in development programming um, after return um, as one indicator that referral mechanisms work. And I would end on one note is I think it's also really important to understand when referrals do not work and learning is going to be an essential part of, of the cycle and usually implementing partners um, are always a bit shy to share um, what doesn't work and I think we really need to learn from that we need to learn more about where the gaps need to be filled, where some of the unions may not have materialized across reintegration and development action. Learning is going to be very much needed to understand where those gaps remain. Thank you very much, Nassim. And, and I think it, it also go back to a point on, on the monitoring, um, the fact that once you do this monitoring, it needs to be used and it needs to be used um, to improve programming as, as you move forward. Um, so thank you to, to the four of you. I think it was important to hear from a civil society partner on how you work um, on reintegration, from IOM on the approaches that have been tested in recent year, and from Samuel as well on the challenge and the work ahead in terms of, of the linkages with the development programs to show that, yeah, these referrals are important. Um, but another point we, we want to emphasize and that we emphasize in the brief as well, that this referral cannot be done at no cost. It takes resources to build this mechanism, to formalize them, to operate them, and also to support the partners on the other end, civil society or government services that either may not have the resources to increase their caseload uh, to take you know, a few more um, beneficiaries also may not have the skills uh, to uh, deliver services to, to returnee and the very specific needs that, that they have. 
So we're, we'll now open for, for questions. So please type your, your Q&A uh, in the chat box. But as we do so, I'll just go back briefly to, to our speaker uh, to ask for a few thoughts on, on the future. So maybe, Volcana, I'll turn to you first. If you have you know, one or two things on your wish list for program moving forward that you would like to see and that you think would, would help uh, improve programs. Well, uh, first of all, definitely, uh... Uh, there should be, uh, if program is developed, it should be a long-term program because uh, there's no such thing as short solution for a short time solution for, for this kind of problem. And uh, of course, uh, uh, I mean, we have in Serbia, we have institution uh, which is uh, part of the, the program to, to, to support uh, ret returnees. Uh, but uh, their resources are limited, their finances is limited, uh, they are assisting, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a state owned, uh, well, not state owned, but uh, uh, state uh, uh, organization, uh, it's an office for, uh, for um, uh, refugees, uh, they do have, uh, from time to time, they do have uh, programs uh, which, are, uh, which can be offered uh, like uh, housing and this kind of stuff uh, but usually they are supporting with the paperwork with enrollment of children in the school with uh, ids etc anyway i agree that there should be a pool of uh, uh, all services in one place uh, different uh, regions uh, different organizations different types of uh, assistance that uh, each organization or institution can provide so that uh, there is one place where uh, uh, Retani uh, can uh, uh, can come and get all the information. I mean, uh, the thing with uh, DMAC is that uh, they are uh, they are not selecting uh, uh, they are not choosing like uh, uh, those who are voluntarily re returning. Uh, in either way, if they are su supposed to come, they will contact them. They will offer them uh, whether it's voluntarily or uh, by force by force, uh, but. Uh, which is actually a good thing, uh, and uh, they are they are uh, as I said we have excellent cooperation. They are presenting uh, what uh, what we offer. Uh, we talk to people. Uh, everything is based on a case to, to case basis. We don't have one solution for all. So literally, we are talking to people. They are applying, giving, providing us with information. We are trying to solve the problem as much problems or, or uh, to offer as much as possible. Uh, to to each uh, family, each uh, individual. So, uh, as I mentioned, we do have uh, this regular project uh, for uh, for returnees, but we are uh, uh, we are tr struggling to 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 reach them. So we have, uh, for example, in Serbia, we have a situation that uh, majority of returnees are Roma. Uh, so we are cooperating with. Uh, uh, local, as I mentioned, we are cooperating with uh, local organizations, Roma organizations. Actually, we are cooperating with. Uh, it's a kind of a uh, umbrella organization for uh, for Roma organization in Serbia. It's called the League of Roma, and uh, uh, their members are part of our hubs, information hubs. And we have, uh, uh, besides four offices that we have in uh, in Serbia, uh, they are kind of a, a information hubs. Uh, we have a like 13 of them in Serbia, or we started with uh, 13 of them, and people can uh, can come there and uh, get the information and apply. Then, if needed, we are also intervening, uh, you know, like with uh, additional uh, answering additional questions, etc. Et but uh, uh, that was the only way to to do this kind of project. And as I mentioned, this referral system is uh, kind of a pilot project, but we are hoping that uh, we will continue it in the future. And, uh, and I also hope that uh, we will do some modifications of the, of the project uh, uh, because, uh, uh, because there are small things that, uh, that uh, are influencing uh, implementation, like, uh, like what I mentioned about the paper, paperwork uh, for houses, but we also having a problem with uh, uh, diplomas. For example, if uh, somebody attended the school in Germany, who comes back? They don't have uh, proper papers, I and mean, this is this is all creating a problem. But thank you very much. Man and it's manageable, let's say. Thank you very much, and thank you for outlining. I think three key issue: one on the timeline, uh, long-term project also help you to have continuity in the services, 
Um, this question also of having all the information available in one place so that returnees are also aware of all the services that are available to them and the referral mechanism that exists. And last one on all also this outreach and making sure that you can reach to this population that um, may not be aware, may also be marginalized, um, or suffer from different prejudice um, and make sure that these also have access to, to the services that are available. Uh, Ravana, if you have one point to make, and then I'll turn to Abram uh, at one question uh, and would like to hear from him on, on the future perspective. Yeah, thank you. Um, maybe I would just want to quickly re-emphasize a point that has been touched upon previously by the other speakers, which is that um, these referrals have very obvious benefits and we've seen that they can help returnees in many ways um, fulfill needs that they have but they don't come as easily as it's sometimes suggested. And they really do require a lot of effort, a lot of working time together and a proactive management of getting to work with these partners. And these need to be continually renewed um, and everybody needs to involved. And so this is really a long-term process where everybody sort of needs to pull on the same, needs to pull on the same uh, string, let's say. Um, and then, of course, the question that we also briefly spoke about is like, what would we, what do we do with what we've done so far? There are things we have explored a little bit more, and really now is the time to to draw lessons and learn from that. And one aspect of that is the monitoring, for example. Um, and here, I think two points are maybe worth mentioning. One is that for referrals, particularly, um, we should look at how adequate the services are that returnees receive, and this is really an issue um, to be to be explored a little bit more. And also um, the quality of services that returnees um, receive through these partner organizations. And so this feeds into this holistic uh, learning process, but also um, into the monitoring question. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think on the monitoring, there is a lot of question attached to once you refer um, the person, you create the system, who should own the monitoring mechanism? Should it be the donor? Should it be the service mm -hmm. partner? Should it be the referral, the organization that is responsible for the referral? Should it also be the, the government? Uh, and we see in some country, the government getting more involved in, in this monitoring mechanism, uh, but this is uh, this is also, I would say, still, still quite limited. Um, I'll, I'll turn to Abram, uh, if you have first some thought on future prospects, um, you know, from where you are, what are maybe the two, uh, two key points that you think, two key actions that needs to happen in the future to strengthen the work that you've done? And also a question on the appetite of, of the government that you've been working with in the, past, in the past few years to build this formal referral mechanism. You mentioned there's been a lot of engagement. How does it compare you know, from country to country? Uh, have you seen some countries that have been particularly active, others that have been a, a bit less so interested? Thank you. Um, maybe I will start with uh, by reiterating the importance of the first point, uh, which is in relation to maintaining the momentum that we currently have uh, in and focusing on building capacities. Um, there are a lot of access. We have created a lot of interest. Uh, there is a, already uh, a lot that has been invested on uh, on, on capacity building, but not uh, close enough to to be able to, uh, let's say, sufficiently rely on referrals and uh, different contributions by uh, several actors. So uh, capacity building uh, should remain at the top of the table uh, for, for uh, the near, next uh, how, few years to make sure that this actually is uh, successful. Um, and the, uh, the next point is in relation to the policy level and advocacy related work. Uh, that is quite, quite critical. Uh, we, we introduced a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, minimum uh, standards and uh, different concepts, but uh, the policy and the uh, strategy and advocacy related work it needs to be maintained and strengthened uh, for the matter to uh, make sure that we have uh, all the uh, conducive environment for all the different actors to uh, operate in. Um, those are the, the, the points maybe are the, are the, let's say, additional, the role of the private sector. Uh, we need to uh, work on that as well. Uh, to, we need to see more of the private sector taking part in their integration 
uh, aspect. And for that uh, to happen, we need to work closely with, with uh, different sectoral and business membership organizations. And uh, that's something I wanted to highlight. Um, on the second question uh, in relation to the uh, how did uh, different government uh, agencies this is a very interesting question because uh, we do have one key uh, set of governments that actually drove this process forward and who have been uh, quite vital in making sure that different uh, stakeholders and uh, agencies are a part of the process. Uh, we can I can mention the for uh, example the government of uh, Nigeria, the Gambia, uh, who have actually uh, taken this process and they have been involved in every uh, aspect of the the the, the referral mechanism setting up and then uh, making it uh, function properly. Uh, but we also see that there are uh, still uh, agencies uh, with even within a particular government which are yet to uh, take up their uh, the role that they are meant to actually play. Uh, it has to do either with uh, some more work that needs to be done in terms of advocacy, or uh, it is uh, boiling down to resource availability where there are uh, still, uh, there is a need, but there is no uh, resource to support and the capacity uh, to uh, act and provide the services. So um, we do have that discrepancy even within those governments that we think uh, have done a good job so far. Uh, there are still gaps that we uh, we need to work on to make sure that uh, we have their full uh, potential uh, on, the, on the mechanism and for them to be able to be there for the retainees that they want to uh, support. Uh, over to you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I think this this goes back to the point on the fact that you need resources, technical assistance, support also to to move forward with this referral and make sure that um, they're being used, they're operational, and that actors know about them and um, and can deliver a bit on on what they have as as a mission in in this MOU, different standard operating procedures that um, that exist. Um, Nassim, I'll turn to you for a question um, that, that we got from the chat on, you know, other example of government-led reintegration processes. Uh, Tunisia has been uh, one of the main ones with this mechanism, Tunisna, but have you seen, you know, in your different research, uh, other, other country, other government that have been particularly active and what does that inspire you? And then maybe why can, um, if we have time for a quick note on the role of local government, because I know this is also a topic that uh, you've been engaged in. Thanks, Kemi, and thank you, Aud, for the question. I just want to come back on the mention that Ravina made on quality of services really quickly. And I think this comes back also to the point that each actor should remain in their field of expertise while looking for synergies with other actors, with other programs and structures. I think we all know that the field of reintegration is attracting a lot of actors, some new, some old, and I think sticking to expertise is really what's required here. And that will build the trust in the system, which sometimes is lacking on the part of returnees, trust, confidence in the system. In Bangladesh, you have a very good example of Brock working under this Aaron pilot project. They were focusing on financial literacy and financial management, which is at the core of what Brock has always done in the field of development work, and then referring them to IUM further. So I think really sticking to expertise is important. Now on the point between government to government, we see some good examples in our assessment of the Aaron work um, in Ghana, notably, and I think this is not a surprise. It's led by the government of Germany, which is one, I think one of the lead governments in terms of the investments and in new approaches to reintegration. The government of Germany has chosen to take, first of all, a whole of government approach in their own country, linking um, GIZ with different ministries, um, and, and you see that in the way their work is, is um, being conducted in Ghana. So basically, there's an MOU now with GIZ in Ghana to link returnees to development programs implemented by GIZ in the country. It sounds obvious, but this is really an exception, but this is exactly what needs, what needs to happen. Um, but the government to government initiative in Ghana has also um, taking the shape of a migration um, information center for refugees, the MICR, which is a BMZ um, initiative in Ghana, uh, which actually wants to do beyond providing a center where 
where returnees can get information, which is key. It's also part of a network building activity. So to build referral services through a network of local stakeholders. Um, this was part of the stated willingness by the government of Ghana to coordinate the services offered to returnees. So it was both a priority for the government of Ghana, a priority for the, for the government of Germany, and then linking to local organizations to identify entry points into development projects that don't discriminate against returnees. Um, so I think Ghana is a good example of that. Another good example of the referrals approach is in Nigeria for victims of trafficking, and that's a collaboration between the government of Denmark and Nigeria, um, working to strengthen, and really because we have to think of specific groups need, to strengthen reintegration of vulnerable returnees uh, and specifically for victims of trafficking. So there they thought about how to build a reintegration network of local partners in the field of anti-trafficking who could be more involved in the reintegration side of the spectrum. Um, so these are two examples I could share. Thank you very much. Volkan, if you want to react to this, maybe in one minute uh, before we, we close. Uh, as far as the government uh, uh, is concerned, I mean, uh, government organizations, uh, I mentioned this, uh, this one organization, uh, this office actually, which is uh, doing uh, uh, and uh, assisting Vietnamese. Uh, I, I mean, uh, this is one of the problems that uh, we, uh, which we didn't actually mention is that uh, communication between different direct communication between different organizations, institutions. Because, because for, for example, uh, I think I, I have some information uh, about uh, their work, although they're officially uh, intended to, to do this kind of work. But still, uh, there's, not, uh, there's no clear information exactly uh, everything what, what they are doing. Uh, they, uh, they do have uh, cooperation now, uh, I mentioned uh, regarding the paperwork re enrollment of children in schools, regarding the, the ID, uh, these IDs. Uh, uh, they also have cooperation with uh, GAZ, GAZ uh, uh, is providing, uh, uh, is financing through them, uh, financing the purchase of uh, 15 uh, uh, houses in, uh, in villages for, uh, for returnees. But uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, somehow uh, information is not going through to uh, all uh, organizations, institutions which are doing uh, the same, uh, same work. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for, for joining the webinar today. I'm afraid we, we have to close, but I wanted to thank again the four panelists for joining. Uh, thank you to my colleague Lisa Dixon for all the support and the logistical aspects. Um, an audio and a recording um, of the webinar will be available on our on a website, and again, our new report is available on the, uh, the MPI website. It's called Embedding Reintegration Assistance for Returning Migrants in the Local Context. Uh, thank you, everyone, and have a good end of the day. <laughs>